ceremonial torch is lit. The rings are multicolored and five. The ill-conceived mascot has come and gone. The Vuvuzelas have been stripped from their owners and destroyed. The host city's economy has been decimated and the semi-interested eyes of the world are upon us. What else could it be? Welcome, fellow contenders, to the Pain Olympics. No, not the infamous internet video of a man chopping his penis off that at least one of you has never encountered and will now be sickly compelled to look up even though you know you have nothing to gain by it. I refer instead to that hallowed tradition dating back to the ancient Romans who would congregate naked in public bitch houses to vent about their problems. Today, we honor them by measuring our struggles against one another's to thereby determine whose depression is the most earned and who, by contrast, should feel guilty for ever feeling down, which, it turns out, is everyone except the gold medalist. Tough break, but again, it is the Pain Olympics. It's been a long four years since last we convened on these fields of broken dreams, in these melancholy stadia shaped like giant metal bird nests for some reason. But now again, the time has come to test our metal in events like the long cry, the 400 meter flee from loved one trying to help you, the impossibly high hurdles, the cripplingly lonely one person relay race, the imbalance beam, uphill bobsled, and of course, freeform hopelessness. Thanks to all of our sponsors, root canals, prostate exams, chemotherapy, and aging, and of course a big thanks to Werner Herzog for directing that very bleak opening ceremony. I especially enjoyed the young peasant boy breaking open a geode only to find his dead mother's voice inside. But enough pageantry. To the field. The athletes are reluctantly crouched at the starting line, cake-like if you will. Oscar Pistorius is conspicuously absent, and as the first event gets underway, surely the fans in the stands must be considering moving parts. The moving parts of the human body, the combination vehicle, cage, and amusement park we all ride around in. They define so much of our life and so much of our mental state. What we can do physically, what we can't. What we could once do daily, but now only do a couple times a month if schedules align. Of course, I refer to showering. But I invite you now to consider the other kind of moving parts. The moving parts of the movie. Like when the dog saves the kid, or the kid saves the dog, or the dog dies. Because it takes pain to know that you're alive. It takes pain to know pleasure. It takes pain to learn. What no one knows, and what no one can control about their own journey, is how much pain is productive, and how much is, well, just pain. Frosting on the cake. Pain to slog through, to move on from, and try not to let warp you too much. So, like moving parts, pain has two meanings as well. It's a chore, and a lesson. It can cripple, or enhance. When we pray for strength, the elders send us struggles, which make us strong. John Redcorn, King of the Hill. Comparing pain, though, comparing each other's pain, the pain Olympics, that's another issue. Case in point, the runner in the purple jersey and insanely short shorts, Michael Swaim, seems to be lagging behind. Is he, yes, I think he is, succumbing to his poor joints, flat feet, and inability to regulate heat? He's also got an addictive personality and poor long-term memory, but I don't think those are directly affecting his performance right now. However, as he has now fallen asleep on the track and is being trampled by the other runners, I think it's safe to say he's not going to meddle. His life is nice, and deep down, he knows it. So let's jump to the head of the pack. As expected, a very diverse group. Systemic oppression and global poverty are certainly well represented, as well as substance abuse. But it's the small personal tragedies, so unique to each of us, that really spice up the athlete's story and tend to capture the attention of the judges. At the judges' table this year, we can see Sylvia Plath, Leonard Peltier, 
Kurt Vonnegut Jr., and Malcolm X, all returned as Blue Force Ghosts in honor of The Last Jedi release. They don't look pleased about that, but that's not necessarily a bad sign at the Pain Olympics. Sylvia Plath rarely looks pleased, anyway. I don't have any stories of personal tragedy to tell you. Not my own. Not this episode. And I won't presume to tell that of any of my fellow athletes. But I do know this one girl, Lauren Moore, who's tearing up the field and looks to be making her move. If she wins, does that mean she has the hardest life of all? Or, instead, that she inspirationally overcame the challenges she was presented with? I'm not sure. The metaphor falls apart at this point. So we'll leave that to the judges. But, while they confer, I have some questions of my own for Lauren. What does it mean to compete in the Pain Olympics? Is it an education or a tragedy? A burden or a triumph? A badge of honor? A right to complain? Or all of these things at once? Let's try and find out, without comparing our pain to hers, for as long as we can. Let's just listen. We'll fail to answer these unanswerable questions, but it's a discussion worth having anyway, and as always, a joy and a pleasure to be human together. I am very grateful to be able to welcome Lauren Moore to the studio this week. Yeah. I didn't want to make you uncomfortable, so I no, didn't no, tell people so. when we you know. start. <laughs> but thanks for doing the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate welcome. it. Thanks. I'm it's excited. It's good to see you for Christmas. I know. Merry <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> Happy yeah. holidays. More PC. Is it? Yeah, definitely. I've, you've never struck me as someone who's concerned about being PC, though. I definitely am more so nowadays. Oh, yeah, all right. I it, think Jennifer's making me more. I was going to say that Jen's influence. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Oh boy, that's a whole different episode. It is. But Jen's like radicalized my politics a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I feel like nowadays with I don't want to be too liberal already, but like with Trump, you know, it just makes me realize that it needs society is set set certain standards and certain ways of thinking, well, and I think f- it's really important to be more pro- progressive nowadays. Interesting, because really? I even wouldn't even consider you. I consider you liberal if I had to choose conservative yes, I or hope liberal so. politically. <laughs> but like socially, you're not. I would say you're more centrist, or like you're not closed off to conservative ideas. But I, but Trump is like yeah. Trump is an anomaly. It's yeah, like, well, I this would, is just definitely. crazy shit happening. Right <laughs> this now. Yeah. is just ridiculous at this like, point. Like it's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I do think it's weird if you're not against Trump. Anyway, this, yeah, this show's is not about that. <laughs> It's about depression. Okay, yeah. And toxins and challenges. Yeah. And I think it's interesting to note you have uh, suction cup marks on your back right now as we I record know. this, right? Yes, all over. And it, uh, they're from cupping. Michael Phelps made it famous, but it's something that's been done for thousands of years as a Chinese technique and mm-hmm. something that I had never really done until my acupressurist told me it would really benefit me. I've been struggling a lot with weight issues uh and strength issues for my injury so okay. it she just told me that would you know could help me and, been and is that, that you feel that you're gaining weight due to is it gaining or losing too much weight oh i've been gaining weight recently you're tiny yeah. though I mean, what is the problem with women <laughs> oh it's because society I, mean, I, say like, a, I say that as a fat guy but <laughs> no see but that's the thing is that we all see ourselves in our own in our own image obviously but with society telling us a certain way to look mm-hmm. it's i've always felt like i was always too big and i was bullied as a kid but i mean oh. well i'm hugely advantaged certainly as a dude because society always told me that it's like whatever like there's yeah. really rich powerful successful fat guys mm-hmm. guys with bad skin and mm-hmm. now we're finding out like monsters. Like I thought you had to at least be nice to succeed in this life. And I'm no. like, I could have been a dick. dick. Whole, not that I want to <laughs> be, but like, apparently I could have been a straight up criminal the whole time. Yeah. And still wound up on top. Well, and even they have, even on YouTube and Facebook, they have like the whole dad bod thing now. Mm-hmm. So it's becoming even more acceptable. But moms nowadays, it's, there's even more photographs and videos of moms saying you can be a fit mom too and it's like well wait why is it acceptable for a dad bod but moms are not allowed to still have baby weight on them i have noticed both of those trends increasing at the same time yeah it's where women are like in this day and age it's look at this celebrity who like got pregnant and then had the kid and then three weeks later looks normal again quote unquote normal again yeah and you're like (laughs) they can accomplish that why can't you yeah (laughs) (laughs) and then you're like meanwhile 
I thought Chris Pratt was sexier when he had a gut. What happened to Chris Pratt's gut? <laughs> yeah, now we don't like his six pack. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> I think Jurassic World just sucks so hard. Oh, yeah. That's another podcast. That's another. <laughs> <laughs> but so interesting, I have to ask, did you begin, like, did you do any acupressure or cupping therapy before the accident? No. Or like before, okay, because the topic of the day mm-hmm. is physical challenges. Mm-hmm. And um, so can you talk a little bit just about like the bare bones of what happened in your accident? Yeah. Yeah. Just because I spent the whole first episode bragging about my car accident. Really? And like how... Tra- traumatized I am. Oh how it's yeah, that's my right. Life. That's right. You did. Okay. And your yeah. car accident and it's like, shut up, Michael's car no, accident. Get out of here. I always tell. It's interesting because when I tell people this story, they automatically start to belittle their own experience, and that's something that I really don't. I don't want you to do that because everyone has their own experience, and everyone experiences it in a different way, you know, and I feel like that in and of itself is something to be acknowledged and people, a lot of people just tend to belittle it just because they're not, if they don't have a permanent damage from, you know, the right. accident, they're like, well, I didn't really go what you went through, which is true, but you know, you've been yeah. through other things and I, that I haven't. And <sighs> that's you know, a, so. one of the main tricky things about being sad and depressed, I mm-hmm. think is yeah, there's a strong impulse to compare to, like, I'll always conjure an imaginary person who's having the worst life imaginable, which I know statistically is is not a fantasy. It's happening. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, what if I was born to abusive parents and then right. starved and no matter what I tried, nothing worked. And then mm-hmm. I died in the field toiling at like age 11. That happens to tons of people. Yeah. And I'm like, how do I have any right to be upset? Right about whatever x Mm -hmm. thing but you have feelings there's like no way to not it is good to acknowledge that you're you know not the only person suffering and that you know you're there are other people out there that are struggling just as much or even obviously more so but not so much to the point where you yourself belittle your own experiences and yeah i think that's an important part of depression is you know once you can recognize the fact that you are in a in a certain state i think it's that's the point in which you can start making progression because you recognize it. But I just feel like a lot of people at the same time, like, no, I mean, the other day I had a conversation with my boyfriend. He's like, you know, we don't have problems like other couples, you know? And I'm like, Mm. yeah, but what I'm talking to you about is still very real. So don't, you know, again, belittle our, you know, problems just because other couples are having issues. And I think that's very relatable to depression as well. It's tempting to hit that button though, right? Like, it's like everyone has a different standard for how much processing and, and stability is required in your life. Mm-hmm. So Jen and I will fight about a nuanced emotional issue. Like you didn't respect this boundary or whatever. Or I didn't feel right. you heard me in this instance. Mm-hmm. And I'll sometimes for sure hit the tempting button to like get out of jail free and be like, some couples are fucking doing heroin yeah. and beating each other. Can we just like relax? That's yeah. exactly what he did. I'm <laughs> like, you motherfucker. And this they stay is such together sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, that's such a cop out. It is a cop out. I think. It is. Yeah. But in a relationship, if you've like reached your emotional limit with the fight, that's a handy cop yes. out sometimes. It, yeah. And it's like counting your blessings because mm, it, it is, is true that you're like, things can be much, <laughs> much worse. Much worse. <laughs> but is it, we uh, interviewed my mom first episode mm-hmm. and she's having an issue with the, she's obviously super proud of all the brave women coming forward and the me too movement, blah, blah, blah. But it's interesting because she also feels the weirdness of like, she feels the need to differentiate between sexual harassment and rape. But then Mm. she also hears like creeps like Matt Damon making that point. And like, she's not agreeing with him or wanting to be in his camp or whatever. Mm -hmm. But as someone who actually survived like textbook sexual assault on the street, I don't know for it's, And I don't, I'm not, I'm going to defer to her, obviously. Mm -hmm. To her, it feels necessary, like, that that's recognized as different from sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. But it's for such a different reason than all these dudes who are like, let's not go crazy. Yeah, Yeah. Matt Day, oh my gosh, when I read that, I was astounded. Well, yeah, and even down to the Al Frankens, it's like, okay, maybe that's like squeezing a bunch of women's butts in photos is not the same as raping women. Right. It's still not good enough to be a congressman. Right. (laughs) 
Like, that's what people don't get. They think being not PC is like, but yeah, you can lose your job, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If that were to happen in any other work environment, it would not be okay. And all of a sudden, it's okay just because you're in that certain sector. I think that's a good rule of thumb. Like, if you worked yeah. at Chuck E. Cheese's and you did that, <laughs> Chuck e. like, you wouldn't go to jail, but you would not work there anymore. <laughs> I mean, it, I guess it depends, though, if the parents are pressing charges. And... Oh, boy. I, I didn't intend to imply like, child. <laughs> pedi- okay. I didn't that's intend where to imply I went with that. <laughs> a 20 year old dude in a greasy rat costume fondling children <laughs> as they try to eat pizza in a strip mall. But that's where we ended up. So let's go to a brighter topic, your okay. car accident. Oh, of course. Yeah. It's a good transition. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just the basics you're willing to share. At least. So this was, so it's 2017. This happened uh, in 2011. And I was driving with my ex-boyfriend from one small town to the other on a back road. And the I was driving a forerunner, forerunner Toyota, and the car rolled over, uh, drove over some gravel, and we were going about like sixty miles an hour. And we weren't drinking, obviously, we weren't smoking. There was nothing that we were doing, you know, that would. But there was like a gravel me. spill on the road, right? Okay. Yeah, just because it's you know one of those narrow two lane roads, um, and we drove over it, and all of a sudden the car, you know, went out of control. It started spinning, and you know, going violently across the road. Luckily, there was no other cars on the road, so that was good. But the con to that is that as soon as we had too much momentum, we swung into this 180 turn, and then because there was so much momentum from that, the car flipped over twice over into, like, this ditchy area. Um, And the con was that there was no one around to see us. And so I was awake for the whole thing. And I remember absolutely everything. So I remember immediately, you know, looking around me and screaming to make sure he was all right. And thank God he was. But he was able to get out of the car and um, he didn't want to move me, but I was asking him to, even though I knew he shouldn't have. Sure. Um, Really at like in the moment you remember being like, were you mm -hmm. having thoughts like you were coherent enough to be yeah. like yeah. we need to get help there's yes. no one in this area yes yeah we need to do this next and this yes next, and like this a next. checklist okay. of like get me out of this car like That's, we need to i mean maybe I think a I lot was, of people do that when the shit really hits the fan yeah right? and i was really scared because i was thinking that maybe the car could blow up like i just had no idea what was going next, on right. so luckily Nothing like that happened, obviously, but at the time I didn't realize that I was actually paralyzed and I physically couldn't move. And at the time I thought it was just pinned. So I was upside down, uh, suspended into the car itself. uh, And thank God for my seatbelt. But the whole car was just crunched um, right underneath me, I guess physically on top of me both. Mm -hmm. So we waited and finally... um, there was a, another car that came and they saw us. They didn't really speak English, but they were able to recognize that we needed help, obviously. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so they said, let's just call 911. <laughs> Finally, uh, paramedics came and after about an hour, they were able to cut my seatbelt. But they, and before they did that, they had to uh, open up the car a little bit more just because they couldn't get me out of the Jaws car of life. at all. Yeah. Jaws of life status. Jaws of life status. Nice. Yeah, and that was, I mean, the whole thing for me was... I was, at first, I was breathing really heavily. I was really scared, but I just kind of had this sense of calm wash over me because I was thinking about my dad. And, Mm. you know, that to me was one of the most memorable moments because I remember going, if my dad were here, he would tell me, calm down, Shell, like, it's going to be okay. You're going to get out of this because if I'm already alive, then, you know what's the next step is getting out and being okay. But at least I made it through the, the accident in and of itself alive. So they were able to get me out, um, and I, you know, they, they put me on a stretcher, and mm. after that, I mean, I, I was still awake. They asked me my, you know, contact information, and next Did they thing, ask you who the president was or any tests like that? Um, no. no? They just okay. asked me phone numbers, and that's about it. Um, and they put me in a helicopter, which I was super stoked about because I've oh, never, yeah. been I've never been in a helicopter. Oh, yeah, never been in a helicopter. And you were conscious, which is nice. Yeah. I would have been at least mildly excited to, like, see what was going on in mm-hmm. mine, but I was totally unconscious. <laughs> no. And that might have been why, cause the fact that I was out for a time, because they asked me, like, who's the president? Oh, like that when okay. I woke up. Yeah. yeah, and I think that was 
But you remember your helicopter ride. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I remember getting in and I remember them cutting off my clothes and I was super pissed because everything was like brand new. Man, I had the exact same thing. They cut off my clothes. Really? And I was like struggling and my dad had to be like, Stop. <laughs> you're confused. This is what's happening. It's right. fine. Like, and it's you're not, fine. I was like, I'll get in trouble. He's like, I'm your dad. I'm right here. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's. I mean, it's kind of stupid now that I think about it. But at the time, it was like, no, I literally just bought all these clothes. Like, I don't, I'm a college yeah. student. I don't make a lot of money. Like, just, yeah. it's okay if there's blood on it. I'll still wear it again. Like, I'll wash it several yeah, times. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but they put me in and um, they started asking me a couple of questions. And then I was smiling because I was so excited to be on the helicopter. And then they put me out with, you know, whatever they did. Just. So because do you remember feeling any pain up to that point? I had no pain, no actually. Pain. Wow. And I had broken my neck, uh, C5, 6, and 7 vertebrae, and okay. I actually shattered my C7. So it was kind of interesting that I didn't feel any pain. I didn't know at the time that I had been paralyzed or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So I think just from all the adrenaline, to be honest. Oh, even all the way into the helicopter ride when mm-hmm. they put you under? Like no one said, no one you told move me your finger or whatever? Mm-mm. Okay. I think the only part I remember being kind of strange was when I was upside down and there weren't any firemen around. Mm-hmm. I was trying to unbuckle my seatbelt and my left arm was twisted upside down into the car. And that was the only part of my body that I could move. But with my right arm, I was like, okay, well, why can't I even lift this up right now? Maybe or it even too like struggle is against it. Right. right. And so I was wondering, okay, well, I can't move my legs. And the entire time I'm just like, okay, maybe I'm just pinned. I don't, I, it's kind of funny looking back on it now. I'm like, why wouldn't I just think oh shit i'm paralyzed but yeah that's what i was gonna ask yeah, there's too much commotion. certainly of course let me know if i'm like pushing too no sensitive. no but like no not at all so it doesn't feel like when you're someone who is able-bodied and instantly becomes paralyzed at least for time in an accident mm-hmm. it's interesting to me that you imagined you felt pinned so like were you feeling the feeling of feeling pressure on your skin yeah so it does mm-hmm. still feel like you had that phantom limb effect of like, mm-hmm. I feel like my body is there. Right. And I, I could see it. I just must be encased in something. Well, and I could whatever. see my whole body because my neck oh, okay. was my, it was almost like a spider. Like You're my, like my whole body over. was hovering over my neck. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was. Hanging from the ceiling. Right. Yeah. And so it was looking down and I could see that my like, shirt there's was. my leg. <laughs> yeah, there's my leg. My shirt's all the way like, kind of like up to here. Right. My stomach is hanging out. I have. My whole body, there's my feet. And so I could see everything was still attached. But it was just this weird mental space of, okay, well, why can't I move? Maybe... Maybe my boyfriend needs to help me move, and I'm glad he did. Your brain just like doesn't come up with the theory right. yet because it's right. not. Because at that soon. point, it's yeah. fight or flight, right? Like I'm trying right. to get out of the car, and not you know worry about what's going on with my body. And right. for some reason, my response was, "I know I'm not supposed to move, so maybe that's why I shouldn't, yeah. and therefore I can't." So okay, yeah. well, I'm happy to report. <laughs> <laughs> That you're here. I mean, we hang out and do stuff all the time. You're yeah. an accomplished baker. Yeah. Making okay. amazing <laughs> uh, gourmet cookies with like photorealistic art on them. So let's talk about how you got from that place to where you are today and and the emotional journey as well. Um, I was, So I went to UC Davis Medical mm. Center for about two and a half months and I was paralyzed for... I probably a month okay. long and that was it was just kind of a weird journey in the hospital in and of itself I remember a lot of times like even the psychologist from the hospital would say like are you okay I'm like yeah I'm fine yeah. oh like, really yeah it would just be this weird mental space sure. you know where my mom and my sister like, especially my sister like they had to help me you know pass bowels they had to mm. wash me they had to move me I couldn't move yeah and I remember them saying to my mom, you know, she's never going to walk again. And I guess apparently one doctor told Jennifer I wouldn't make it. So when, you know, the doctors are telling your family this. But not you? No. Like they weren't? Okay. Not the time. they want to keep you positive and like fighting no matter the circumstances. I think so. But one doctor I remember did tell me, you know, you have the possibility of never walking again. So in your mind, did you ever, did you go through the process of planning for like, well, what could, you know, what joy can I suck out of life if I do end up being paralyzed from the neck down? Or were you like, no, I'm going <laughs> to walk again? Right. That was my mental. That space. seems more like you. Yeah. But I was just wondering <laughs> to be clear. Yeah. I mean, I think what really hit me was I 
pretty much ignored that. I said, okay, well, no, I'm good. Yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> what does he know? So I'm going to walk again. But it was more so when they told me that I didn't really realize what, what, what my injury was whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So I have always been the believer that, you know, if you really have the ability to think it, then you can do it, which obviously has its limitations. But at that but time... It's scientifically, like, backed up very right. strongly. Just that your brain has way more control over your body than you th- consciously know it does. Yeah, that you give it credit for, so really. You can, you can develop that skill, and, mm-hmm. and visualization really can affect shit like your blood rate and the level of white cells in your bloodstream. Right, Right, which is crazy to think. Positive thinking. Yeah, Yeah, and I think that's kind of the concept. I had two of my cousins from my mom's side of the family come to the hospital and pretty much coach me on positive thinking. Mm. And it was very helpful, but I think at the time when I was in the hospital, I just wasn't even registering the fact that this was going to be a forever thing. I was taking it day by day. And one victory of being able to take a shit on my own is uh-huh. a victory in of itself so the small things like that were what really got me through and of course having my family there and yeah was absolutely you guys are, was that embarrassing for you or are you guys so tight that like it didn't matter with my family helping with helping with the bathroom stuff oh that didn't really matter to me Cause, okay because at the end of my uncle's life pancreatic cancer he needed help mm-hmm. to you know move his bowels and my dad and his other brother helped him and uh he was, I guess, like emotionally devastated every time, like didn't want to be seen that way. Right. And I was course. like, I can see that and sympathize. But also that would be the least of my cons- I am- If I when I project right. that myself in this space, I'd be like, I mean, if my brother's willing to wipe my ass and I need my ass. Yeah, wiped, the, thanks. Man. That's low <laughs> down on the list of like shit that's going wrong. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, but I think thanks, it's, bro. <laughs> I think I was more embarrassed around like my nurses and my therapists because strangers I don't. Yeah, they're strangers. Upset. Yeah. But as I stayed there, I became extremely close to that staff and but isn't I isn't it interesting we'd rather be a burden to the people we love the right. most than yeah. have, like <laughs> strangers true. who are paid and chose because to do that <laughs> they're supposed to love you no matter what right so but that's kind of folds into depression yes. too. you push people that love you because you're like I can vent to you mm-hmm. I know I can get away X amount right and tomorrow you'll just you still love me, me and still love me right <laughs> and that's kind of the Jennifer and I had a very strained relationship especially when I came home because I remember oh, yeah. she had to do my hair she was helping me do my makeup again she was you know bathing me um, and there had been many of times where I was like no I don't like this and I was trying to become an independent person but with her there helping me we got into many fights because she's like I'm doing the best I can and I'm sure it's awesome. Yeah. You can see you know? the, a dual side from of her course. too. She's like, but I'm going out of my way, way to help you, yeah. which is nice. Mm-hmm. And, and I resent that you're not appreciative and no. you're like, but I just want to do it on my own. Yeah. Right. And I look back <laughs> and I'm like, man, I, I definitely could have handled that better, but I was also on a lot of medicine. So you guys gonna... are so close. And it's like, I think another thing is people sometimes shoot for the ideal that relationships should be flawless or, and right. their life is their goal is to be happy all the time, all mm-hmm. the time. And that's just not going to happen. That's not the case. Right. So like the fact that you guys are super close and love each other, I would argue that if you objectively judge (laughs) the amount of chaotic shit coming into the system, Mm -hmm. you handled it amazingly well. I would (laughs) hope so. I mean, it's, I think that's kind of one thing about my experience at the hospital that a lot of the therapists and nurses and even doctors still remember because they said I was so positive throughout the entire experience. But I think a lot of times I would just wasn't really wanting to register what was going on. I hadn't really broken down yet. There had only been a couple of times in the hospital where I was absolutely by myself, which was really rare, where I completely broke down. And one time in particular was during Thanksgiving, they made a trip to the whole, I guess, spinal cord unit wanted to make a trip to the grocery store so that we could actually cook for Thanksgiving. And it was the first time that I was, I was still in a wheelchair and Mm -hmm. I had to be lifted into a van and then buckled in. And at that point, my mom and my sister were in a car behind us. And I remember thinking to myself, I can't do this for the rest of my life. Like, this is not what my life is going to be like. Mm -hmm. And not to say that you know, it's a bad thing to live your life like that whatsoever. But I just didn't think I was strong enough to handle that f- for the rest of my life. For you, did that manifest as like uh, overwhelming panic in that moment? Oh, definitely. Or yeah. like numb, like 
well, I just can't deal with this. Or, But it was more like a panic attack. I think it was more, well, I had a lot of panic attacks in the hospital and they sure. gave me Xanax and it was, they would always say, well, what is this brought on by? I'm like, yeah. I, I don't know. Probably PTSD from the accident the in and of fact, itself. But like, <laughs> I don't have to finish the sentence. Like, right. you know why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And All it, the shit that happened. There was just so much going on and I had... I mean, I was having hallucinations from like a Whoa. a blood or was it like a spinal tear and something had happened where oh, that's can you explain that on like a neuroscientific level? Oh God, I'm not. I'm yeah, trying I'm like to on the spot. articulate it a lot better, but it was like a spinal tear can make you. Hallu- Do you mean like seeing things that oh, were not I there? Oh, I thought my dad was there. Okay. And my dad, and dad passed away when passed. I was 16. Yeah. So for me, and, and I remember Jennifer knows Shout this. Out Steve, we love you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, definitely. I, he was there. I mean, I do believe he was there because right. that for me was, well, I, okay, so let me but go back. But you still admit that some stuff was hallucinatory. Oh, for okay. sure. <laughs> it was crazy. Like I thought my mom's dad was there. So okay. I was seeing people and I mean, the amount of pain I was in was so extreme that Everything that I had been to up to that point was so minute in comparison to what okay. I was experiencing. And, and wait, at what point? Just when? So this is the spinal the spinal tear. And they had said that and it... And that happened. That was like a new development that happened while you were in the hospital. While I was in the hospital. Something further in your spine tore. Right. Okay. Something tore in my spine and they wanted to... Um, deal with it with a what is it called a blood patch so they wanted to medicate it with a blood patch and fix it up and when they told me you know what the what the repercussions would be or what the consequences would be of having you know a blood patch I was like I'm not getting that done but as I was being rolled to the room to get you know the brief of what a blood patch was and then as I was being rolled out of it because I denied the the treatment, uh-huh. my <clears throat> spinal cord doctor was there, which is super rare because he was on that. It's a completely different unit in the hospital, mm-hmm. completely different for. And he had told me like, why the hell are you not doing this? Like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. You need to be doing this. So I got it done and that was painful in of itself. They just took some blood and put it in my spine and that found the tear and patched it up. And like a scab or something, yeah, like just exactly. normal blood healing a wound. Yeah. What were the repercussions they feared? Like, is there a way that can go wrong? Yeah, that it could just cause more damage to my spinal cord injury in and of itself and could cause so just like, like, like hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging, it could have, like anything. Yeah. So it's amazing what we can do and can do. Like, it's amazing. They're like, yeah, we're going to shoot some blood in there. We think it'll get better. Might get worse. Do you want the blood in there? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but at that point, it was even the doctor said like, you know, you're having hallucinations about people that aren't there. You're screaming in pain and you haven't been in, you haven't been the most complicated patient that we've had so far. Sure. Like I've had procedures done where it was supposed to be extremely painful and other people would be screaming and yelling. But because I knew I had to be still for the procedure, I would just sit there quietly and take the pain. Uh-huh. So in his mind, he was like, why the fuck would you not get this procedure? So yeah. that was a interesting experience, but I would say from the hospital in and of itself, UC Davis Medical Center was just the people there were what made the hugest difference for me. And I, I mean, you're very close with some of your personal trainers, right? Your physical yes, therapist. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I don't even know if you're allowed to be, but I think that's kind of hard to in that environment when you see somebody go through. Right. Well, let's name something. them all and get them in trouble. I know. Who no. was unprofessional? <laughs> no. And and it, uh, you you're starting to consider angling your career toward that direction as well, right? Right. So yeah. I think it's so interesting and important for a lot of people's journeys that trauma shapes us Mm -hmm. and can become obviously the traumatic part is always traumatic Mm -hmm. but i don't know that i would have become a comedian without my car accident and i'm glad that i am a comedian right and jen will get into this on her own time on her episode perhaps Mm -hmm. but of course there's thing there's traumas that i think are very clearly like why she's interested in social work Mm -hmm. and i'm not saying you sir you definitely wouldn't Mm -hmm. but who knows if you would find like physical therapy to be an interesting field i definitely without this experience i definitely wouldn't have whatsoever because i was so set in what i was going to be doing or what i was going to do before i got into my car accident so So. i just want to say people out there who are experiencing so much depression pain that you are thinking like maybe it's time to cash in the chips or check out whatever that means Mm -hmm. to you even the worst thing can later be like huh but i wouldn't have done this without that that's interesting right it doesn't make it not shitty that Mm -hmm. that happened Mm -hmm. but just see the rest of the movie 
That's yeah. a big message on this. Like, wait and see what yeah. happens. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that stick it out. It's for that whole experience. It. I really wasn't interested whatsoever in health. Uh, I wasn't really interested in spinal cord injuries. I didn't know that there was a lack of knowledge really in that area, mm-hmm. just in society. And so for me, that experience in and of itself really did change. I mean, I mean, after the accident, I didn't still wasn't even considering and I was doing sure. therapy and I worked, you know, for intelligence. Uh, and can so, we say, <laughs> we'll just say intelligence. Yeah, she we'll worked s- for an intelligence agency of <laughs> note. Of note, <laughs> it sounds so. Oh, yeah. yeah. So with that, I mean, I really loved that job. I don't know that the injury in of itself just really over time while I was recovering, the more I noticed people would come up to me with the same injury or even worse injury and say, "Hey, what do you do to combat spasticity? What are you doing to combat, you know, your nausea? What are you doing to combat tonal?" And it's everything like that is important to me because. My mom and I have always been huge components of research and actually learning what things are about. So if the mm-hmm. doctor said, well, you, you know, have in your, what was it, your brachial plexus, you have a tear in your brachial plexus. I'm like, well, what, what's a brachial plexus? Right. So for me, learning everything about that was so pivotal because if I don't understand my own injury, how do I know how to treat it? It's nice that they were willing to explain it. Well, there are some doctors who'd be like. Just do what I say. Yeah. I have 12 <laughs> patients. I have to tell what to do. Just look it up on Google. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think that I mean, really drove knew, me. Uh, spinal tear could give you hallucinations. I feel like now we're going to have burners like injuring oh, their no. spines. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, I don't want to be a proponent for that. It's, it's really high, painful. <laughs> it's really painful. Extremely yeah. painful. So don't, don't do it. <laughs> I, yeah. It goes without saying, don't try this at home. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. This isn't jackass. Like, don't do it. Because I notice now you are, like, you're doing cupping therapy mm-hmm. and uh, you mentioned acupressure. Were you always gung ho on, like, holistic medicine plus traditional Western medicine combined? Was it research that led you to, or like, yeah, what's just the mix of what, what techniques worked for you? What did you find work? I think it was a mixture of both because I recognize that Western medicine was still very important. I mean, when, mm. if they hadn't used steroids as soon as I was rolled into the hospital, I wouldn't be walking. Right. So I recognize that, that there are a lot of advantages to it. And you, we really can't ignore Western medicine just because of big pharma. But there are a lot of holistic approaches that as I was recovering, I was like, I don't want to just take a bunch of pills every morning and, you know, completely numb my body mm. and... I want to know what my body needs because I truly believe that there are better holistic approaches that are way better, you know, for your liver and for your kidneys, because those are the kind of things that I still want to take into account. Yeah, there might be some pharmaceuticals that will help me move my hand better or, but in the end, is it damaging my liver? Western medicine's really bad at like, and there's like two pages of side effects. Right. And if that happens to you, there's some other pill to fix that. You can take, right. So That's I definitely yeah. I recommend the holistic approach first because I think that if you have tried, you know, do the whole rule of thumb of trying everything first and then take the more extremes if you absolutely have to. Well, I love so. you found I know you go to the gym a lot and mm. do physical therapy, but you've also really geared your hobbies towards helping with your condition. Right. And I think that's like. Uh, the baking, but also you just started playing video games, yeah. which I'm super excited about. If you ever want to guest on One Upsmanship and talk about video games, oh my god, you'd be a good guest for the South Park episode. I love. Well, <laughs> I did play video games before, okay. but it wasn't as. I think now I like I want to play video games more because I've read that it can help with the brain to you know hand stimulation like your right. nerves are uh, wanting to move right so dude, it, as a nerd who grew up playing video games that was our only excuse or response when people are like why are you playing football or street hockey <laughs> or whatever the regional now sport who's is making all the money and though like, i'm developing my eye hand coordination grandpa <laughs> Like one day when I'm repairing robots in space, this skill will be valuable. Yeah, It will. And now people are making a lot of money actually playing video games for companies. Well, that, I never thought that would happen. Just yeah. Like, uh, growing up, the popular thing to want to be for me and my friends was a video game tester, which right. sounds like being an ice cream taste tester. And when you get old enough to like look up, what is it actually like to be a video game tester? It's boring and horrible. You think so? Yeah. Video game testers basically... We'll play one game for three months, and for eight hours a day, it'll be like, 
literally walk to every square of space that you can physically walk to in the game and see if any bugs happen. Oh, you, yeah. other person, fight every enemy in type in the game, but only use this one weapon. Don't use strategy. Just go attack, 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 oh, okay. and just make a long list of if any, if they all work or if there were any that were messed up. Mm-hmm. It is a terrible <laughs> job. Very Talk about low depression. Too. Yeah. <laughs> no, you'd much rather be a person just playing video games yeah. online and enjoying like PewDiePie them. shouting racial epithets. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I would. So I started baking actually. I've always loved sweets, but I started baking because I really wanted to use my hand in I've therapy. Always loved I've always, I've always <laughs> been a strong fan, but with baking, I really wanted to. <clears throat> excuse me, I've always wanted to. Um, I guess well, I've always been artistic, so I did acting for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And after I realized that because the acting world is superficial. I really don't think I can do acting anymore, which is fine. Like, there's some people that would disagree, and that's totally fine. <laughs> I'm not gonna argue that it's a tough road to hoe, but I'm pleased at some like Walt Jr. Right, exactly uh, from Breaking Bad. Really had cerebral palsy, and he did a great job. Uh, right, there's ex- there's there are, but they're few, they're right. few examples. Right, and I think for me it was I always wanted to be. It sounds so cliche. I've always wanted to be like the Meryl Streep, and I really thought that I was talented and acting enough to make it to that point. But I just thought after this injury, I was like, really? Because I, I got to say, it. and I'm sorry if this is crass, but in the moment, <laughs> the way Hollywood works, I would have been thinking if I can maintain my acting talent and I'm like semi paralyzed, that's Oscar, like the instant Oscar. <laughs> my left foot. Part right. Two that's how you thing. get. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I do feel like for good we're in a phase where people are trying to be more sensitive of like if it's if you're going to portray a really extreme life condition either have someone the person who wrote it know what Mm -hmm. they're talking about or cast someone who authentically right but then you begin to be typecasted that's a whole different thing yes right it's like it annoys me that we all think peter dinklage is a very good actor and mm -hmm. i'm uh yet still every movie is in his physical limitation if i'm sorry if it's offensive to call dwarfism that but that's like the focus of his character arc like even right. if did you see three billboards outside Ebbing? no i'm still it's really really I good need to see it. and I've i was really pleased things. to see him in it and just have an arc where he's just a guy mm-hmm. and the last scene of his arc is great but it does also involve him being like everyone thinks less of me because i'm a small person and it's oh. like i'm looking forward to when there's just like it does. He's just in stuff. And right. It doesn't ma- come. It doesn't up. matter. <laughs> yeah. I think that's well. That was kind of the thing for me. This. I mean, this was before this whole movement really mm. happened. So, I began to become a little bit more limited in my careers at that point. Okay. And so I had begun to think. Okay. Well, I'm still very artistic. Like I did dancing for a number mm-hmm. of years and. Everything I had ever done with singing and acting, it was like in a way to express myself artistically. Of course. But in order to still express myself, what can I do that will also be therapeutic? And you immediately thought, intelligence services. <laughs> <laughs> De- well, that was more so to just pay the bills sure. and to find out like secrets. But then it was also, I could do baking on the side. So that way I can do my cookies and I can do cakes. Actually, and- well, because I'm not recording for a second because there was a technical error. Can you tell us the go- all the government secrets? No, I don't the, believe It's you. off. No, I don't believe Do you it. keep your mouth close to the microphone though? <laughs> <laughs> well, you tell us no. the government the secrets. secrets. No, okay. <laughs> never, never. Okay. No, but so artistic outlet. To, yeah, and I we think were. that's kind of what's so important is that once you become, you have this physical limitation, you really have to start thinking about the new me. And that's air quotes because when I was in the hospital, they're like, this is going to be the new you. So what are you going to do to continue living your life? But you have to make these altercations, but still recognize that you have a mind and you're not, you know, a vegetable. Like, what do you want to do right. still in your life that you can realistically do so i couldn't be a government agent because i can't run you know i can't shoot mm. a gun so with you that shoot it guns, was, don't you with my left hand which is okay. a real bitch to be honest oh. because the trigger finger is just a completely different okay sense so you and, can't be jane born and just shoot always with your left hand okay i mean i could <laughs> well and that it also attributes to the fact that i'm i'm having a decline in strength and so mm. with the weakness that i've been experiencing lately 
it's I can't shoot as well as I used to and that makes me even more upset because I'm like I'm comparing myself to what I used to be constantly and especially at a young age when you're going out and you know seeing people you know do certain things it's like okay well I can't go hiking anymore I can't Mm. do this and I really feel limited and that's and yet there's you know. continuity there because in the new things you're choosing to do, you're still paying tribute to the person you are, right? Like mm-hmm. I, it's, you took that artistic energy and you're not like, well, I'm not artistic anymore. Right. You found a new way, a new to, way to do it. Right. And, uh, well, the main thing I remember is you just having fun jabbing your leg into cactuses when we oh, were that's camping. Right. When it was still, is it, is it numb now? It's still, yeah, I don't feel pain or temperature on my left side. On your left side, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, the first couple times we went camping, you would be like, look at this. And just, like, (laughs) swing your leg into a cactus and be like, this is fine. This doesn't hurt. Well, that's (laughs) what I tell people. I'm like, if, you know, if I ever get mugged, then I'll just turn to my left because then I won't feel it. And then... Dude, and you... So, how does that... How do you experience that? Because you have mobility some mobility back in your left side oh i have complete mobility right. in my left side but and yeah you don't right. feel pain you feel or pressure temperature. you feel pressure though. yeah i feel pressure okay okay it's actually far worse so like if so i'm my point is you could like bludgeon a mugger with your left side yeah and they'd be fighting back and be like why doesn't what? she feel pain and you just be like that's right bitch. it does I'm left side strong it's really weird i feel like a deep tickle, which is almost way worse than feeling pain because it's oh. so uncomfortable. Oh, but you feel like your nerves do something. Yeah. So, yeah. which is good because if I step on a tack, then at least I know I'm You'll stepping know. on something I shouldn't be. Right. Um, the tallest man in history died because he was so tall that the nerves in his feet didn't give signals to his brain about pain. No way. And he slept one night with a candle too close to his foot. And like burned a huge hole in his foot that he didn't feel till he woke up. Really? That got infected and killed him, yeah. So it's like literally his oh nerves were too physically far away from his brain that the messages were really weak. Was he like seven, eight too or something? Too weak to wake him up. Robert Wadlow, I forget yes. how tall he was, yeah. I thought he was around seven, eight. I think eight there's or... taller people since then, but he was the first famous the first tall guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and I think that's... Uh, for me that's important to recognize is that okay at least i can still feel something there but it's not uh it's i mean what like waxing is not painful when i get it done you know (laughs) down there so it's like that's awesome oh i see yeah Yeah. but anything else wait okay is it straight down the middle like does half of the waxing hurt oh it is straight down the middle so you'll be like okay we're gonna do your right side now and you're like oh (laughs) <laughs> like, no. like, yeah the uh, left side it's a breeze <laughs> or just have your boyfriend get used to you like this is the look now girls wax on one side only. <laughs> that's what's popular uh, i don't <laughs> know very would, lucky i think he would be fine with anything I'm sure, at that point. I'm sure he's supportive <laughs> well let's talk a little bit about the emotional stuff okay. not that we haven't been but you alluded to i guess and i i just want to do service to on this show always like all right what's the bad part like right, of course. you were saying you do experience some depression and uh or well, I mean you describe it in your own words. What what's sort of the emotional challenge you face with that balance of like staying positive, knowing that staying positive actually helps you mm-hmm. maintain and heal, and then I'm sure there's days where you're discouraged. Right. What is that like for you? Um, it's been pretty rough recently. Uh, I quit my job in June. So that or I guess, yeah, it was June. And for me, there hasn't been a lot of validation. Uh, I think with the recovery for the past six years, there's been a huge recover surge of recovery there. I haven't really plateaued um, to the point yes. where it's noticeable. And when you're making that constant recovery, you know, you're getting stronger and you're walking and you're actually like jogging a little bit, you know, making all of those small triumphs, mm-hmm. the, the depression wasn't really there. Um, because I was like, I'm doing so well for what I have. And I am so lucky because I could have been, I should have been completely paralyzed. And it's one of those things where like, if it was an inch the other direction, right. you'd just be dead. Yeah, yeah exactly. So it's like, you should be feel lucky in that sense. Exactly. Yeah. But I think that the, uh, what a lot of people don't tend to recognize is that there is a middle ground with injuries and with, you know, disabled people, Mm -hmm. because there are people that you really can't see the physical ailments. And it's really hard to live in a world where 
people expect to see something physical if there's something wrong with you. Sure. And if someone isn't seeing you with a cane or with a wheelchair and they see me parking in a handicapped spot, I'm like, well, what's wrong with her? She looks really young. And it's like, okay, well, it's I you know, have yeah. something. like, and But they're also not appreciating. It's like, man, you just dismissed all the pain I've been through. And like right. I've worked thousands of hours to get to this point. Right. And you're like, you look fine. Yeah. And that was one. I mean, when <laughs> I lived in Davis, I was I parked in a handicap sticker or sorry, a handicap spot. And I used my handicap sticker mm. and I was literally going to my acupressure therapy. And when I got back, I got this nasty note that said, do you really believe you deserve to park here? And it was like underlined. And there are some people that really need this spot and you are fine. And I'm like, and you wish Man. you'd be like, I wish I could just teleport you to help me move my bowels once in the hospital. Yes, like back experience. in time. The nastiest of all the bowels. So you could be like, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that shit on that note. Well, yeah. and that's the thing. I, I kind of read it at the, at the point I was like, you know what? That's awesome because she can't really see, or I guess it, it's That's awesome to the to point it where it's like, okay, my recovery really has been dramatic to the point where she doesn't see. Strangers feel comfortable being dicks, dicks to me. Dicks to me. <laughs> so that's awesome. I'm making good recoveries. But at the same time, I was like, man, there was a lot of things in the hospital that I clearly remember being so emotionally draining and just mm-hmm. being so exhausting that it's like, man, she just has no clue. And that's, you know, that's fine. Like, I'm not going to fault her for not knowing. But I think that there is a huge issue right now where a lot of people need to become aware of this middle ground that if you don't see a physical injury because there's no medical device yeah. next to you, that doesn't mean that there's not something wrong with them. It could right. be mental just as well, well as it could be and physical. And there's a lot of medical devices that are embedded inside your exactly. body now. Also, yeah. like, yeah. Technology. Stables and bars and pacemakers and there's right. shit that's on the inside. Well, and it's <laughs> and I think it also attributes to the fact that I'm so young. So like if, right. you know, you have my, my mom doesn't look super old, obviously, but if she were to park in a handicap spot, <laughs> she looking. Yeah, um, we're in her house right now. If she were to park in a handicap spot, a lot of people wouldn't ask her questions because she's older. So they'd uh, automatically assume oh well maybe she has something wrong with her back or maybe there's something wrong on with the her inside because yes. she is a wrinkle yeah, yeah she's wrinkly right but if a young you know person is walking outside of the car and they have a little limp they might assume oh well she has like a soccer injury or she has you know like yeah. something really small beans right, of kind course. of thing small hey. beans hey. well done <laughs> i'm gonna good. require that of every guest from now on. <laughs> but so that's what's so troubling about it and i think that's really contributed to my depression is sort of how you feel that the world has changed how it views you as well definitely okay and i well it's hard because i live in these two different worlds so at the same time i'm living in a world where i can go out with my friends i'm lucky enough to walk into a bar and i can order my own drink without you know being in a wheelchair i don't have to use wheelchair access um, and you're in touch with feeling like grateful and happy about right. that and all that. Yeah. And it's great. And I'm part of the group where, you know, people are like, oh, do you want to play beer pong? And I'm like, yeah, but I have to use it with my left hand. So it's like I don't have these challenges that people would have if they're in a wheelchair. Right. So that is is great to be a part of that community where I can understand what it's like to be in a wheelchair. But I'm so grateful to the point where I'm so independent where I can go into the shower. I can walk into the shower by myself and I don't have to lift myself into uh, onto a toilet. So that's the part of my life where I still derive a lot of depression from though, because I feel like I have to live up to a certain image. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's like we were saying everything's relative because I was just going to say I'm sure there's listeners in wheelchairs. Right. And I'll go like, to that end. I don't mind that much that I have to lift myself onto the toilet. I'm grateful for this and that and exactly. this. Right. So you adjust but in, to the reality of your life. Right. And I think you're able. there's a lot of people that I know that have the ability to lift themselves on and they're grateful for that in and of right. itself. But then when you go on to the other end of the spectrum and you have people that are quadriplegic and paraplegic. Plegic. Well, this is every. This is the scale, and then you go like, yeah. and then there was that guy who was completely paralyzed except for his right eyelid. Right. How can I ever feel bad and about that's, anything? That's ever? the struggle <laughs> because I I see on a daily basis quadriplegics and they come up to me and they're just like, oh, what are you doing to get better? Like my goal is to literally do what you do, and it's like, right. okay, 
Well, I at that point, my depression starts to stem from that spectrum because I, now I feel bad that I don't have my injury as, as I guess, it's not an extent as... I don't know how to That's say so it. That's so interesting. Really. No, I think is it's you're like torn between the two worlds. Yeah. Where the quote unquote like fully able bodied world is like viewing you as fully able bodied and not mm-hmm. understanding any right. limitations you have or cutting you any slack for that. Mm-hmm. And then in the world of like the community of people who are facing similar limitations, you almost feel guilty that like oh, you're totally. at the top of that bracket right. now. Yeah. You're almost like too able body. You're like rubbing too, it in their face. Well, and that's, or it's funny because where I go for physical therapy, there is a guy that is, you know, quadriplegic and he does it out of jest, but he goes, you know, oh, you're just goes, a faker. Like, and I'm poser, like, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I laugh with him about it because I totally I'm understand. Sure he's what, just like building loving community with yeah. you, but you're like, but I do kind of feel guilty. <laughs> yeah, of course. And I understand exactly where he's coming from because I don't have those daily struggles that he has whatsoever. But at the same time, I have those struggles that I don't really articulate to those people because if I do, I'm just like, man, it's, I feel like a piece of shit now because I can't run. And Mm -hmm. here I am talking to a person that can't walk. So it's going in between those two spectrums and it's almost like living a double life, you know, but having someone by your side that understands those struggles. Like if you're going to, if you're able to go to a bar with all your friends and you can't walk as fast as everybody else, then it's going into the part of my mind where I'm like, wow, I'm, I can't keep up with everybody. Now I feel like shit. And it's right. just kind of or like, am I making their night worse? Than right. And now I'm, you know, they're pitying right. me or they feel bad that they have to walk slower. And of course they're not really, but that's just what you right. feel. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's definitely over exaggerated. Right. Of course. Sure. Of course. Uh, that's another thing about depression is it's humorously self-centered or like, The reality is, or most of the time, at least in my experience, when you're thinking, man, everyone here hates me, Mm -hmm. the truth is closer to no one there is thinking about you at all at that moment. Yeah. (laughs) Like they weren't actually even considering Considering anything about you. (laughs) Yeah. They were just doing whatever, talking to someone else. <laughs> and and it, like, yeah, it is very self-focused. That thing they did must be about me. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I always think that every time I'm like limping into a room, I over-exaggerate like everybody's looking at me. Or if me. they slow down, you're like, they must be so pissed in their heads to mm-hmm. go four seconds slower. It's like, they don't care at all. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, that's the thing is that my friends are like, no, it's fine, we can wait for you. Or why don't you take an Uber instead? If it's going to sure. be like a mile, then you take an Uber yeah, and we meet you that. there. And then I'm concerned, you know, maybe my boyfriend's like, well, I can't walk with everybody. But in reality, he's like, no, I totally understand you're going through this. Right. So of it's course. fine. So having self-respect enough not to accept dicks in your life. Yeah. Like <laughs> supportive friends and, you know, loved ones. Um, what else or like, what else do you do to combat times of discouragement is, or, and what has worked for you? If anything? Right. Well, I would say finding meaning in what you're doing every single day. So I was mm. reading recently, I've been reading a lot of literature that kind of speaks to being in the present more so. Yeah. And for me, I've always been the type of person to really think about the future like wh- who am I going to marry like how I'm yes, going to have kids this and, is one of the basic secrets of life yeah and right now I'm thinking okay well instead of getting so depressed at the fact that I can't pick up a dish the way that everyone else can or that it takes me 10 times longer to cook because I have to fix everything that I'm doing in a certain way I have to cut right. a certain way instead of getting depressed about that I really look at it in the present and I go okay I'm doing this the way that I can only do it right now and I'm taking enjoyment into it. And even if I really don't enjoy doing laundry, if I don't enjoy doing dishes or any chores that are really, you know, hard on me, I look at it and I really, you know, maybe I'll like count while I'm washing dishes. It's nuts how if you develop, it's just like building a muscle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you develop the discipline to choose when to be present. Mm Mm-hmm. The world is always awesome. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's a good right, way to look like at it. Like, literally, just the light bouncing off your hands as you wash the dishes. Right. You can be, you can be like, well, this is satisfying enough. Mm-hmm. Like, the water's warm on my hands. It feels good. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not easy. Right. You have to train your brain to be able to access that place mm-hmm. of being present. Well, well, what kind of stuff are you reading? Are you reading Power of Now? Oh my God, I am actually, I think. Oh, I love it. That's great that you said that. Yeah. I mean, my, 
I, I mean, I have a lot of people in my life right now that are like, you need to be reading this book, you need to be reading this book. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll read it. And then when I do, I'm like, man, this is something I could have utilized a long time ago. I think he's got all the basics right. As mm-hmm. you explore him more and more, he ends up coming off a little smug, like a lot of gurus do, where they're mm-hmm. like, come to me, my child, and right. I will bring holy light to solve everything wrong with life. Right. But man, the basics of what he describes in that book, I think mechanically Mm -hmm. really work well for me. And (laughs) another one that I was reading, I think it's called the voice, the voice of knowledge. Okay. And that one is really good because it really does teach you how to be in the present and really appreciate everything that's around you. So Mm. especially like the summer when I've been really depressed, like it's just been shitty. The summer has been really awful for Mm. me. And if one thing wasn't happening, another thing was happening at the same time. And adulting throughout this entire (laughs) summer while trying to balance. He almost made it through the episode without using the word adulting. Oh, I mean, honestly, it's (laughs) if I, I mean, it's been rough because I feel like I had this, I had a group of friends that I was constantly around and then they berated me, not like scolding, but they really were blaming the fact that I had a boyfriend that I wasn't around. I'm like, no, I've been really depressed and I uh-huh, haven't been able sure. to tell you about it. And I really become reclusive when I'm depressed and I've been sitting at home and rewatching Breaking Bad. I've been oh, rewatching right, yeah. like everything to take my mind it's off of what's going on. Yeah. So light and anything. <laughs> well, I just was, you know, staying inside my own home and not right. even going outside for like two days on oh, end and too. drawing the shades. And, yeah. and it was just one of those moments where I was like, man, this is disgusting. Like, what am I doing? But I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying at the same time. Mm. So instead of reprimanding myself for being reclusive, why don't I sit here and just go, you know what? It's okay for me to feel like this right now. It's okay for me to be depressed. Uh, the old ride it out method. Yeah. That sometimes I, that's all you, there is. I do like, believe oh, in I it. have the flu, basically. Mm-hmm. I have to ride it out. <laughs> mm-hmm. And just go, this is just a period in my life. This isn't forever. And mm-hmm. I'm going to take this opportunity for this summer. I'm unemployed. The first time I've ever been out of college unemployed. I'm going to utilize this opportunity to think for myself. And it sounds super cliche, but that's what I did this summer was really think, okay, well, I don't have this job anymore. What do I really want to do with my life? Mm -hmm. And it was such a huge moment for me that um, I sat there and I had this epiphany and tears came to my eyes. And it was honestly like the most... yeah amazing and beautiful thing I could have experienced because I immediately called my mom and I was she was like why are you crying I'm like I'm so happy that I've discovered this you know and it was coming from such a dark place before and now it's that dark place like exactly what you're saying like stay tuned for the whole movie because there are better things to come and Mm -hmm. it just takes that time to really get to know yourself in that point in time to see how you respond to it yeah. and how that response can structure your future, I think is really what I yeah. what I got from this whole summer. Um, but from the injury in of itself, it's like what we were saying earlier, that taking the little moments and just really enjoying those moments for what they are and you know, just finding new ways to look outside and just enjoy it and be in the now is just something that I've Mm -hmm. really valued. And I think that it really helped me practice being able to enjoy life. Yeah. Like it's a skill that you have to practice. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) Well, because there's things out there that, you know, when you're, when you're disabled, obviously you, everything is so much harder and it's not just Mm -hmm. mentally, it's just obviously it's physically harder for you. So with that new me, it's just, everything is, I mean, the other day, I made a tuna noodle casserole. I was super stoked about mm. it. And I was on the phone with my mom and I got it out of the oven. It was like a healthy tuna noodle casserole. Yeah. Got out of the oven, put it on the counter. And I was like, hey, there's no hot pads. I'll move it over to the other side of the counter. I moved it over. And then as soon as I picked it up, I dropped the entire casserole. Oh. And there was glass everywhere. Right. And of course, like Not shit happens. Noodles. <laughs> oh, it was just, and that was so depressing because there was glass everywhere. But I noticed that within that moment, I was, I was so anxious and I got so upset at myself. So your brain's already registering like it knows how difficult this will be. 
to, to get every tiny piece of glass. You're mm-hmm. like, now I have to do this. Yeah. Well, and then I blamed myself and my injury because I'm right. like, if I didn't have this fucking injury, I wouldn't have dropped the casserole. But calling my mom, she uh, was like, no, really? I, I, I just want to say I dropped lots of dishes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's because and, for me, like I said earlier, it's over exaggerated. But there's no guarantee. You still might have dropped. It. I still <laughs> might have dropped. And that's the thing is that when you have something like this with this injury or any type of injury, you automatically just want to blame it on that because it's sure. easier to do so. Mm-hmm. But as soon as I cleaned it up, there was a, a vacuum that I got out of my closet that I've never been able to unload and open mm. up. And for the first time, I was like, I'm going to use my feet. I'm going to use my elbows yeah. and my wrists. And I opened it up and it was like this little triumph so, moment. Yeah. So you're going you like know? positive, negative, yeah, positive, I was like, negative. I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, I'm going to fucking vacuum all these panko crumbs That's up. That's awesome. You know? Yeah. So challenges provide new opportunities yeah, to triumph. And it, it did. True. It really did. And I feel like that was a moment where... I was really proud of myself because I was really, it was like, I had just received really good news about getting a new job. And, you know, this week is, thank you. It's been like a roller coaster of emotions this Mm -hmm. week. And then all of a sudden, one night, and like the cats threw up on the carpet as soon as I dropped the casserole. Like, every. That's nothing. It's not, but it just like snowballs. You know, the the wrong time. Right. Right. Yeah. So everything was snowballing. My life is spiraling out of control. (laughs) Just this one night. Like, I had no more wine left. And like, everything was just like, fuck this night. You know, but to be honest, it was, you know, that moment of triumph was like, okay, well, out of everything that happened, now I know how to defeat this vacuum cleaner, mm-hmm. which is a really awesome feeling. Yeah. So hold on to that feeling. I, <laughs> that That's a all the time we have. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is normally where uh, people would plug things. Do you have anything to plug? Acupressure. Yeah. Okay. You recommend acupressure. Where can people hear you sing online? Oh, yeah, uh, nowhere. You I mean, declined to comment or you declined to post ever? To sing? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I sing in my... Sh- I don't know. I, I That's something I probably will do in 2018. Next episode, I'll force you to sing on the show. Yeah, maybe. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, thank you so much then. Thank you for having me. I appreciate um, you it. You can't follow Lauren on Twitter and Facebook because she has government secrets, so it's no. not allowed. Or you can follow me on BS Baker, which you is You can on follow Instagram. her on BS Baker. That is a thing. That's it is quite a fine thing to plug. BS underscore Baker, B-A-K-E-R. Yep. But I mean, it's just it's just like little, you know, baking things. Don't and sell yourself short. No, Go but check out all the awesome, like, cookie art she does. It's yeah, pretty it's, incredible. It's to entice people to, if they have an injury, then, you exactly. know, what you can do to... Yeah, Change and it. if you have an injury and you don't have a community yet, reach mm-hmm. out and find a community, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, awesome. thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Let's go eat lunch. <laughs> this has been a Small Beans endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The Beans always have new ideas percolating, so make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash smallbeans. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash small beans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the small beans grow into huge giant monster beans. If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you. <laughs>